Well, I am excited to have this conversation. Uh, it's, it's with someone I've been wanting to get on the show for a long time. Uh, we're going to touch a whole host of things. Those of you who are watching this can see my good friend, uh, Thomas, who's on. Uh, listen, I want to talk to you about a lot of things, but r right out of the gate, yeah, will you agree with the statement that knowledge is like the oil of customer service? Well, you, without really with a good question, I would say yes and no. Okay. How are <laughs> so, you? Well, on, yes, knowledge is the essential building block for pretty much everything we do. You know, so like, yeah, no questions about that. But I think the difference is if you don't apply the knowledge, it, it's mm. useless, you know, and I think that that's the big difference, you know. And uh, I, I just came a, across a really interesting quote, which I just want to start here, you know, from Yuval right. now, uh, Noah uh, Hari. <laughs> I, hope, I, oh, I, 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 I know. I love, he is my favorite historian. Uh, Yuval uh, Harari. Yes, he is yes, my favorite. Yes. What, what's the so quote? He, he mentioned there is a knowledge paradox, which I, I just came across, I think, last week, which was really fascinating. He says, yeah. knowledge that is not applied is useless. Mm. Which, which is like, okay, I can see that. But where it gets really interesting is he say, knowledge that changes behavior then loses its relevance. You know, it's like, a, oh, wow. Yeah, that's a kind of, once it's embedded, um, you need to think about the next thing, you know? So uh, it's just constantly evolving, you know? And that's why I think knowledge management and all these things we are t discussing is so um, relevant and exciting, you know? I... I can't wait to jump into this. So give people a little context. So I know you as one of the thought leaders around this topic of knowledge. So give folks a 30 second background and gen ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have his LinkedIn and all that. You can go check him out. A, a context on, on your background and specifically as it relates to knowledge. Yeah. So for the last 14 years, I was a director of knowledge management and an ERP software company. And prior to that, I worked for three Fortune 500 companies, knowledge management and other areas as well. So have been around the block for a very long time and really excited about talking to you because I think it's a famous triangle. It's like technology, people and processes. You know, it's like one can't solve everything, but uh, knowing all three is a really powerful uh, solution, I think. Well, I am... Excited to getting to know you now, but I'm surprised we haven't our circles haven't haven't crossed. So I'm I'm excited I'm excited you're here. I had a conversation with you and I I learned a lot. So really excited you're you're doing this. Well, same here. You know, like I I came across your name on a podcast and uh, I was just hooked. One 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 podcast and one thing which still resonates with me is a yeah. quote you mentioned. It's like. A, I can never call a 1-800 number in front of my kids. And it's like, I had to tell my wife, I thought like, that is so sad, but it was also so true, you know? <laughs> yeah, because you never know what kind of profanities I'll start to yell. And I'm an usually mild-mannered guy. So let's go a little bit back in time. You and I, you know, have... Uh, a lot less hair than some people and we've been around the block right uh yes. so they, they say that's wisdom let's yes. go back let's go back in time right we've been at this for a while i got into this business in the 90s and i've watched it kind of uh, evolve and change but if you go back then i feel like on the one hand we're having the same conversations now going on 30 years later so catch me up from as far back as you want to go, the early 2000s, late 90s. We were talking about knowledge and content there. Bring me up to speed as to how we got here. Yeah. You, you know, like one of the things I always find fascinating is like never underestimate the power previous generation had and the wisdom. Yeah. You, you know, like, yes. like think about the pyramids. We, four and a half thousand years later, we still debating like how did they do that and i think a lot of things we knew in the 90s what to do and how to do it better but the technology was not ready yet you know right and uh, I, I attended a very interesting uh, it was actually a sales pitch from autonomy back then 
<laughs> I remember but, autonomy. Where are they? Are they still around? <laughs> <laughs> they were purchased by HP and then sold. And but the ideas and the knowledge they had was fascinating. So I was there, um, learning about neural network. Uh, you know, like a, how how important this is. And it's like, wow, that that's cool. And then in 2000, I came to Silicon Valley and mm. uh, we implemented the, the first professional knowledge management solution. Prior to that, I built it myself. And it's like, wow, now we purchased one. That must be great. So, you know, being me, I come and say so like, hey, is it based on neural networks? And they're like, right. what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, we, we have indexes and we have search algorithms. Like, Taxonomies, well, yeah. But that can't be it. You know, it's like everyone can build that, you know. And then so what we actually build, we just build a new silo. Uh, you know, here the CRM system and we had a knowledge system. And the problem was it was something in addition for engineers to do. And... The adoption really start happening when we start embedding that. You know, we embedded that in, in the process, so it was not an, an additional thought. It's like, well, this is how I do it. And so they're like, well, actually, I can do it faster, better. I don't repeat myself. And I mean, now nowadays, you look around, you see uh, Salesforce and service now, they all embed the knowledge piece as part of the offering because it makes just so much sense, you know? Yeah, I, I I think that's an interesting way to think about the evolution, right? So like we're in this 90s, again, the same ideas, we just didn't have the technology to do it. And you're right, a lot of this solution into knowledge ends up creating new silos. Now, they may be better silos than the old ones, but but, but it is. Let me take a little detour. Let's stay here for a second, which is I've often wondered... Anytime I talk to clients about knowledge and content in general, uh, the one place that always had me stuck was all the stuff in people's brains that they don't ever write down and all the stuff in emails, all the stuff in sticky notes on their, <laughs> on their, yes. on their, on their computer. You mean these ones? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as you, I know this is a little off the wall, but as you think about knowledge in, in your, in your dealings with clients and customers, what do you say to them? Just give up. You're never going to get all of it or what's. <laughs> well, if, you know, you could think about that, but what I have learned over my career is like people want to do a good job. You yes. know, it's like um, I had a very challenging situation recently where we, we shut down an entire China operation and and moved the knowledge from China to Mexico. You mm. know, if, if it's like, well, they will never tell you what they know. You know, like, why would you? They they know they were, will be let go six months. But if you treat people with respect and give them the time to actually do knowledge work, you know, knowledge transfer and also tell them the right story why it's important it's like hey you can leave a legacy do you want to have a broken product behind you or you want to ma maintain a legacy where you can look back mm. and say wow i worked on that project you know it's amazing i mean people really went to the the extra mile to get this job done so just because it's challenging, if you embrace it from the right side, you can actually get things done which you're like, wow, <laughs> I would never thought about that. The, the other thing which I really like what you mentioned, Amas, is like uh, emails. Uh, and, right. you know, like uh, it really depends what the company wants to do. You know, like are we the close-minded company? We're like, well, I don't want that someone sees what I wrote here. It's like almost likely nobody cares about that. But if you have something that is in, of interest for the company, then why would you mind to share that, you know? Right. And the technology is there. You know, you could actually index the entire email communication. And when it's relevant, you can bring it in. If it's not relevant, it will never uh, uh, come up. So there's a lot of things you can do if you want to do. And I think we will have a lot of this conversation with AI, like what do you want to do with AI? How, how far you want to let AI go, you know? Well, to that point, uh, let me not... Let me not hold you back anymore. Um, <laughs> let's let's get in there, which is my problem statement is most organizations struggle with knowledge. And then I listen to someone like you and you tell me about all of this 
like possibilities. You just said something provocative, which was that we can go index an email box. I mean, there might be reasons why people are listening to me, like legals, like, please don't do that. <laughs> I know you guys have been talking mess about some of your colleagues and that, but let's just put all that aside. Let's jump into two things. Why do most organizations still struggle with knowledge in the world where you're telling me about all of these possibilities? So maybe you can do two things for me. Tell me a little bit about these possibilities and why most organizations, I'm not saying some, I, the people who have knowledge figured out are in the minority. You're going to be you're going to be working until you're 80 if you're planning on solving this problem. Like I, I don't know many organizations who are in a great place with knowledge. So uh, close the loop for me. Why does it still suck? And talk about what is possible and, and why we haven't made as much progress as I'd like. Yeah, well, uh, let me see if I can answer this question. <laughs> well, I, I think the first part is really like, do you make it a priority or not? You, you know, mm. like, uh, you, you get what you pay for. Like, it uh, doesn't matter if it's a car or, you know, like, uh, the performance of your company. You know, like, if it's not a priority, it will not solve itself uh, because it's a right. challenging project. But so I think what many companies have not understood is actually um, – they don't know what they already know. And, you know, there is a, a famous book by Carla Aldell, which is a classic, but, uh, you know, like if you would just be able to leverage what you already know, you will be so much further, you know? And the nice thing about that is we have now the tools to, to bring that up. You know, like uh, um, just think about how we worked well, most likely even five years ago, you struggle with a product, you know, you like, oh, I have an error message. I don't know what to do. Let me find the website from the company. And then, oh, the, I need a login to get to the support website. He's like, okay, well, here's the password. Okay. You go in now, oh, where is the knowledge base? Oh, they have a forum. Oh, here's the user documentation. And it's like, wow, we make it really hard for someone to solve the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Now in 23, what we can do, we can actually shift the entire experience around. You know, it's like uh, I can have a listener to error message on my screen. You know, like, whoa, there is an error message. And we can now intercept the error message. And like, whoa, it seems like you have a problem. And we can now bring the knowledge to the person uh, It's like uh, based on their role because now systems are start finally talking to each other. It's like, I right. know if it's a manager, I know if it's a power user or a novice user. I don't want to bring the same knowledge to a power user than a novice user. But based on that, uh, I can actually give them information like, oh, well, thank you. That's fantastic. I can actually now finish my transaction. And I think this is where it gets really, really uh, interesting, you know. But, you know, the problem is still the technology can now do this cool thing. But if the data is not clean in the back end, it doesn't matter. So it's still rubbish in, rubbish out. You know, right. and I think the maintenance uh, is so important. That's why like systems like KCS, even sometimes they feel very rigid. It's like, well, whenever you go check it, update it, flag it, uh, enhance it, makes so much sense. You know, it's like a, it's a small piece, but overall it, it really makes a big difference. I, I think that is so spot on, which is, you know, do you value it? You know, many organizations say, you know, data is oil and, you know, we started at that quote there, but do you treat it like it's, it's precious? Do you invest yeah. in it? Do you do all of those things? As I listen to you though, can you comment on this sentiment I've been toying around with, which was how much can these new advances around what we can do around AI how much of that is like, you know, the Ozempic pill that's going around now where I could just take a pill and not work out or eat, I could eat whatever the hell I want, right? Uh, does AI do something like that where it's like I can not worry about data hygiene and what have you? I just, I just give me some of this knowledge AI stuff and I could skip over that. I don't need to work out. I don't need to, I don't need to eat well. Can you comment on that? Well, yeah, I think if AI is implemented correctly in a corporation, 
it will give you time that you can work out. <laughs> okay. It'll buy it, it, time. Okay. Yes, yes. I, 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 you know, like many people talk about the co-pilot approach for AI. It's, it's like, a, it, it's my, my buddy next to me. It's like, I can delegate work to them. It's like he, I can brainstorm with them. You know, it's like, a, I don't want that he replaces me. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Because not that I'm just selfish, but I just think it's like, uh, what I have seen with many AI products I, I tinkered around is like, first you get the wow effect, like, wow, AI can write an entire book just by providing five words. It's like, well, yeah, it can, but that's not really hard. It's like, does it write right. the book you really want? And like, no, just randomly. It's like, and then you, you, the more precise you want to get something, the harder it gets. So I think it brings you to the 80 percentile or 50 or 60 or whatever. And then you really need to apply your knowledge. And if you don't have the skill, you actually, I think the quality will go down. And it's like, wow, that's what you produce. If you are a master of your skill, you, you leverage that and now have far more time to put the hard part on top of it, you know? Well, and that, that's how I see it with uh, generative AI. I, I play around with uh, image generation. And I mean, the first time I'm like, wow. And then a <laughs> funny, uh, there's like, let me just put in, uh, I prepared the pre presentation. I want to see a robot and a businessman doing a, a arm wrestling match. It's like, uh, you know, technology versus business, you know? And then it was a brilliant picture on the table. I mean, it was really great, but they were holding hands. I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want holding hands. And the system just didn't understand arm wrestling, which is, that's a, a common term. And But then it comes to, Oh, you, you can feed um, an image as, as the ground and to build on top of it. And now with Dali E3, now we, I can do it. But, um, you know, like you need to know the technique to really get the full value out of it. You know, so that, I, that's a kind of my take. No, you're, you're, you're spot on. Ladies and gentlemen, I try to uh, see if there was a plan where you don't have to work out um, <laughs> clean up the data. It sounds like AI will be an enabler. It'll help you get there faster, but you still got to do the the basics. Let's uh, let's switch gears. I want people to get to know you. Um, I, I asked this question of some of my guests. What is something maybe silly or serious you spend an inordinate amount of time doing? For me, I like to cook. So I'll spend hours, especially grilling, like smoking. I'll make spend 12 hours making ribs only to eat it in six minutes because I just. <laughs> That's my AI question regarding the workout. <laughs> See, I thought maybe there's a deal. You could just put it in here. Um, so what do you spend an unreasonable amount of time doing that people will not get? Oh, if they don't get, um, well, first, where I spend an unreasonable amount of time is reading, you know, like okay. I, I, I love right. books, I devour them. Um, you, you know, it's like, it's so bad that <laughs> I had to donate like 10 boxes of books because I couldn't put them any more. So electric That's books awesome. are really uh, um, a game I see change. For an AI guy, I'm seeing physical books. What gives? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it's like, you know, like you have the classic books you just never give away. And many of them I bought before digital books were available. And there is something about the smell of a book Me and too. open it. Um, but too. I like the convenience of a digital book. Um, apart from that, I mean, I really love spending time with my kids, you know, not work related, awesome. but, uh, you know, I have a three year and a six year, well, four years now <laughs> since last week. It is just fast time, you know, to kind of regenerate, uh, get a new perspective. And then also think a little bit long term, you know, like I, I freak out about AI. What will they experience? Where will AI be when they are 20? You know, it's like, wow, you know, like uh, it will be a different world, you know. I, I I couldn't agree more. And listen, spend every second you can with those those kids. I feel like my son was four years old yesterday, and now he's nineteen. <laughs> so so enjoy it. So thank you. Let's get back to knowledge and in yeah. this topic here. So knowledge is a mess, and I know people <laughs> use the word knowledge and content. It's a mess in every organization. Uh, the world isn't falling apart. Right. Well, maybe, maybe it is. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, 
why does this matter? Why have you dedicated 14 years, at least in, the, in, in one organizations, why does it matter that we get knowledge and content right? Well, it is very important for many different reasons. Well, first of a company, you know, like you don't want to have dormant knowledge lying around. You don't want to have efficiency. As I mentioned, the knowledge, I couldn't care less. It needs to apply to make a difference, you know? And the, the problem is many people don't even know they have a problem. You, you know, mm. it's like inefficiencies can be dormant for years. You know, it's like, well, that's always how it was. It's like, well, it could be totally different if you come with a different approach. And so just this uh, recognition that it could be better, uh, it, you know, most problem can be solved if you don't understand the problem. Uh, right. The other thing is what I have struggled many times in my career is that things that add revenue are much higher on the priority list than things that save money. Uh, and I, I think that that will be a very interesting conversation in the future because if AI starts saving you, let's say 20%, what do you do with this 20%? Because you don't want that the time just fills up with the other work and you have not really gained anything. Um, and we have seen many companies who, who just like, well, the, the gains just went away. Uh, so the, I, I just had another thing regarding the, the benefits. Oh, the prioritization. <laughs> right. like the prioritization of companies. You know, it's like a, what I have seen, especially in recent years where, you know, you feel like the competition gets more and more heated is that cost cutting often trumps good customer um, experience. And mm. the fact that most likely many of your listeners can relate to your 1-800 story is just so sad. You know, we, we almost take it for, well, oh, this is just how it is. But I actually think, especially now, with the tools we have, it's the time that people can make actually a good user experience a corporate differentiator. You know, like if you actually figure out how to do that, I for, foresee that many new nimble companies will emerge and start taking away uh, market shares from the bigger companies who are just too slow to go with the time. And it will be interesting really to see, it's, it's like the new 2000 where we saw all the startups some became really big, like we got the, the Facebooks and the Googles before, like, no, it's the IBMs and the Microsoft, nothing else can actually uh, penetrate here anymore. And then like, oh, and I think uh, we are in the same or a similar situation where things could really change, you know. I, I agree with you. Um, again, uh, if you're just listening, I am chatting with my good friend, Thomas. Uh, I've been wanting to get you on the on the show I especially like your optimism. I, I think the way I I put it is this is the mid nineties again, right? With AI, with the dot com piece. And there's yeah. going to be there's going to be lots of value. The new Google and Microsoft, they're being born probably as we speak, or they're gonna be born yeah. in the next few years. So the possibilities are endless. Let me switch to a fun topic for a second. I want you to talk about I asked my guest a a purchase under fifty dollars that um, was game changing for you. So for me, there's plenty of things I can choose from, but mine, I suffer from allergies, and I bought something called a neti pot. It's this little pot you put the water and the saline, you pour one nostril. Now, the box is a little bit of false advertisement because there's a young lady on the box. She is pouring this thing in and it's so elegantly just flowing out and it's perfect. When I do it, it's like I'm waterboarding myself and I'm choking <laughs> on my own. <laughs> but it gets the job done. And it's like a twenty dollar thing, and when my allergies yeah, yeah, get I... bad, it is it is a game changer. So I'll turn it to you. Uh what is a purchase of purchases that are under fifty dollars that you're like, this is this has made a big impact on my life? Yeah, it, it's maybe, it, it may not sound as personal as what you share, Amas, but um, if you know me, I can't always differentiate between my personal life and my private life, because, uh, my corporate life and pri private life, because I'm so 
passionate about, about what I'm doing. Right. That's why I read all these books all the time. But so I would say actually when I was younger, I took a ticket to go to this uh, Amazon, um, Amazon autonomy uh, show because it was a game changer for me, not just by what I learned, but it, it has actually guided me for 25 years in the vision where we could go. And mm. we, we, we talk about the, the email uh, introduction. In the 90s, autonomy showed a system how they index every piece of knowledge within a company. So all your internal documents, your online forums, and the emails. And what was really cool is in the demo, they start typing an email. And as you typed, you start seeing, oh, you Search talk results. about Amos uh, when you have user experience stuff, and he wrote the white paper. You want to read that, and you know I work for really big companies, and there were situations where I worked for two months, three months on a project, and then my manager approached me, "Have you ever talked to this guy in in France?" I was like, "I don't even know this department. Why? Why? I think he works on something very similar." I was like, <laughs> "Really?" So I reached out to this guy and. We were really, I mean, the overlap was like 90%. It's like, oh my gosh. So we spent all the time bringing these two projects together. And then like three months later, the project got canceled <laughs> because the company acquired a new company with a better solution. You know, <laughs> if we had a system like that, we could have known when we started, like, I should talk with this guy. It seems like he does something else. Right. And while M&A information is secret, but they could see that, well, there are different entities in our company working on that. We, we should put a halt on that, you know? Right. But it, it is just, uh, we don't know, you know? So that was a game changer for me, just from the vision what's possible. That's, that's How long ago was that? That was in the mid nineties. It's you, crazy. You, you know what? What I know you're an optimist and I'm going to try not to bring us down. <laughs> but what saddens me is you saw a demo in the 90s and it is the year of our Lord 2023. <laughs> and there are many organizations that don't have that. Like, you know, and, and it's I think it speaks to your point earlier about this three legged stool of people, process and technology. It's cliche, yeah. but it's yeah. so it is so, so, so true. I was on, a, on, a, on another conversation I was having with another guest. There's a book I've been reading. I'm almost done now. It's taking me so long. I'm reading multiple books at once. But anyway, I know that. one of the things that was fascinating to me was in the 1800s, you know, the most popular car in America was an electric car. And in fact, in fact... It was fait accompli that we were all going to be driving electric cars. Like it was a done deal. Like gas, gas powered cars, th there was no way to produce them. What's funny is the same headlines about range, about I uh, way to charge them and all of that, all the same things was true. And if I showed you those headlines, you would think they were written in 2023. They're exactly the same, right? Not exactly, but same sentiment. Well, yeah. And that's what always gives me this humility to say nothing is inevitable. The technology can be fantastic, yeah. but you need people, processes, and all the stars to align before this thing is real. And, and you sharing the story of something you saw in the mid-90s that is still not the norm at most organizations is all the proof you need. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, to add something, something. Even if everything else aligned, it still sometimes needs a tipping point, an event that, oh, now we can't do it. You know, it's like, uh, it was funny, like uh, talking about green energy and all that. You know, it's like, uh, well, we don't have time. And, and, and then about 10 years ago, the big companies suddenly start talking about, well, we need to be green. Because suddenly green was cheaper than being not green, you know. And suddenly like, oh. Now we don't send all the things over the ocean. We, we bring factories back. And it's like, the margin were so small. It's like, wow, because of this small margin, you moved everything over there. And so, yeah, I, I like hearing stories like yeah. that almost. That's you're, fantastic. You're right. Um, I've got a couple more places I want to go. Um, uh, what do you tell companies? Sounds like you do it in your personal life, friends and family, when <laughs> someone asks you about knowledge and content. What's your best advice that you give to them? 
for knowledge in general, um, well, I, I would say don't try to figure it out all by yourself. Leverage someone who has already done it and mm. are the specialists. You know, it's like a, I, I managed a, a team of technical writers for many years and many people like, I, I like to write. I, I wrote in college, so I can write. It's like, well, but there's a difference between being a professional and being kind of an amateur, you know? Right. And uh, the same thing is for, for knowledge. I mean, yes, you can Google things up, but there's a lot, the details is always the hard pieces to figure out if you're not a, a professional, you know, you, you oversee them, that, that's important. Like with AI, it's like, well, I saw AI writing this book uh, and the demo is like, yeah, but it can't write an entire user guide for you in five words. You still need your professional uh, people. So I would say it's like a leverage what you already know and take the experts and, uh, not reinventing the wheel, you know, like the, the, the mantra is actually pretty easy for knowledge management. Solve every problem only once, you know? Mm. I mean, mm. you know, it's like uh, we don't have time to repeat it. And if you just get that, you're already far ahead of many, many people. You know? I, I think that's an excellent place to leave it because <laughs> however you do that, if, if you're listening to me and you are in this business, if you can solve every problem just once, whether you do that AI, what have you, you are ahead of 99% of the, the crowd because we know that is not the reality um, for for most. Um, I want to I, I wanna go to another fun place here. Another question I like to ask my guest is for them to reveal some of the life mysteries they found out later in life. So for me... I was a huge wrestling fan growing up. I think we're um, the same Gen, Gen yes. X, Gen X yes. generation, and I, the Iron Sheik, the Undertaker, those are all my guys. I am in college. Was when I find out that the whole thing was acting. That like this all was a script, and I got to tell you, it broke my heart. And I, I remember everyone looking at me like, how did you not know this? <laughs> right? So I'll, I'll turn it to you. You know, what uh, life mysteries did you discover later in life? Yeah. Yeah, I have a good one. But before we go there, because you just brought about wrestling, you know, like, I'm a strong believer to manage your work as much as your perception of your work, you know? Yeah. And I haven't always done that, you know, it's like... A... <laughs> But if it comes to wrestling, you know, it's like a, it's fake or it's not real. Well, from a viewer perspective, it doesn't look fake. You no. know, it's, it's as real as every other movie. Exactly. And from a participant uh, perspective, you know, it's like, have you ever stepped in a ring? You know, like either you get seriously injured or the show looks really lame, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, like what is fake and real these days is a kind of hard to say. But um, I, I, um, I love this guy. He's making me feel better already about not knowing this information. <laughs> but to yeah. it all. <laughs> it was like uh, for me, it was um, it was not wrestling, but it was like Christmas. You know, like mm. uh, you know, like when I discovered like a uh, whoa, Santa is not real. First, I felt like whoa, I'm so smart that I figured it out. You know, like my <laughs> sister didn't know that. But then I felt them. Um, embarrassed like what you said like uh, oh my god it uh... took me quite a long time to get there you know but now in here hindsight you know like uh, i changed actually how i view this event you know i i felt almost a kind of a, a sadness I that i discovered it because the, the the anticipation for this magical night you know the joyful and the innocence you know it, it's gone it, and so sometimes that's actually a nice thing to have. And, you know, if you bring that actually into business, you know, it's like uh, as our customers, you know, like uh, try to manage the perception. It's not just a okay. technical thing. Keep them enlightened and happy and positive. Even if you know in the back end, like, whoa, that was a kind of a bad situation, but we could make it happen. So I think it is boss and I, I think it's a fantastic question. I, I... <laughs> I listen, I, I think you you hit on a good point, just so you know, uh, in my house, because I don't know when folks are going to be listening to this, but we're recording this in October and Christmas is coming. <laughs> I, you do not get presents in my house, no matter how young or old you are, if you do not believe in Santa. So I have 19 year old kids 
kids in college saying, yes, of course, Santa is real. Because if you do not, <laughs> you're out. So I agree with you. Uh, keeping a little bit of magic and mystery uh, yes, is, 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 is important. Um, on that note, I uh, we usually like to end the show by leaving folks with something smart you read, a quote, or, or something like that. I'll give you mine. And it just came to me a second ago. Uh, and you will know this quote, uh, in God, we trust everyone else bring data. <laughs> and yes. and uh, that is one of my favorite business quotes uh, of all time. Uh, what, what would you want to share with, with the folks I, out there? I love that you mentioned data. I, I, you know, I was like, wow, what could I bring up? But uh, I, I think actually that you, you, where you, you come from and what you experience over life sets a kind of a, a set of reference, you know, it's like how you see the world. And sometimes you're not aware of that, you know. And I, I had a discussion uh, last week and I discovered this company is generating one terabyte of data a day. And it's like, a, whoa, that, that's a lot. And so I, I asked the guy like, uh, um, hey, how you guys deal with that amount of data? And he started laughing at me. He's like, Thomas, one terabyte is nothing. In my previous company, we had, 50 ter uh, petabytes of data a day wow. and i was like uh, okay and then you know like uh, after the discussion uh, it dawned on me is like you know because i came from a smaller company and that's just set your your reference points you know it's like wow a terabyte was really big and that created a leading question you know it was not a neutral question it was already a leading question and the second thing which i found quite fascinating that even i was so pro technology that it can help that it, i totally underestimated actually the power but like yeah. 50 petabyte a day i mean it's like oh my god i never even thought that's possible you know so i just found that quite entertaining and uh you know, it's, hum you it's humbling. To, yeah, and you have to step over your own shadow if you want to move forward. You know, it's like, oh, you know, um, check, yeah. uh, check your ego at the door, Thomas. You know, so, um, but I like, no, <laughs> I like your quote a lot. That that's a, that's a good one. Um, that's a good place to leave it. Listen, I I want to bring you back on the show. You and I, I didn't know this about you until we recorded. Um. Uh, uh, Yuval Harari is also my favorite um, historian. I've read every, listened to every podcast, every word that man has written. So we should have a show just about the future <laughs> of where we think the world is going. I want to hear where you agree with him and disagree with him, but we'll have to bring you back from, um, for that. It will but be a great thank, pleasure. Thank you so much for, um, for joining. And uh, we're going to put uh, his information out there. You guys go check it out on, on LinkedIn and follow him. Uh, one of the smartest guys on this topic. <laughs> oh, thank you so, so much. It's been, it's, been, it's been a joy. And for my listeners, uh, again, uh, I hope you um, have a good rest of your week. And please take care of yourself. And if you can, each other. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much. You've been listening to an Amos Talks production.